Peace, people. Uh, in an important but often neglected and overlooked event in the period of late antiquity is the warring finale to the millennium-long Romano-Persian struggle for dominance in the Near East and its surroundings. This particular Romano-Persian conflict, deemed the last and longest war of classical antiquity, is characterized by some as having been something like a world war for its time. It was a quarter of a century long series of battles which effectively shook its audience to their core, from the theatrics of its actors leaving a wake of destruction in every theater of war. And here to enlighten us on some of the details concerning this event from his latest book, uh, The Last Great War of Antiquity, a book that has not only made uh, use of a wide variety of sources in a succinct and chronologically coherent fashion, but also reads like a well-scripted war drama fit for the silver screen in a Hollywood cinema. I would like to welcome Dr. James Howard Johnson to my podcast, Real Talk with Teron Poole, for what I believe will be a thought-provoking discussion on two of the greatest empires from the past. Uh, thank you for joining me on my platform, Dr. Howard Johnston. A pleasure, a pleasure. And just to give my audience a little bit, uh, uh, make them familiar with your background, although I believe many of them already know who you are because several of my acquaintance not only recommended you to me, but also said, uh, recommended the books I should read of yours. Uh, but Dr. Howard Johnston is an English historian of, Byz of the Byzantine Empire. He was university lecturer in Byzantine studies at the University of Oxford. Oxford. He is an emeritus fellow of Corpus Christi College, Oxford. His approach on Byzantine follows that of Edward Gibbons and concentrates on comparisons between the Byzantine state and its Western counterparts. Also, Howard Johnston has done much research on late antiquity, especially the Roman Persian Wars and the coming of Islam. All right, and so this is my first question, uh, Dr. Howard Johnston. Um, if you don't mind me calling you James, your last name is you know, please really call long. me James. It's ridiculous. To say, to, to, also, also, I rather objected to the notion of being called doctor uh, because you have to get a doctorate in order to be uh, an, a university academic. And so, I in my college, I insisted on being called Mister. Mister. Okay. Uh, so um, you call me James. Okay, and uh, you know, I wonder, I do wonder about that because uh, I interviewed uh, Mr. Michael McDonald, and I noticed that he also uses the Mr. in front of his name instead of Doctor. Yeah, uh, yes, I, 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 he's a really good man. He's a really good. The things he knows about Arabia before Islam are as unmatched by anybody else in the world. Well, with one exception, a Frenchman. Um, one Frenchman who knows as much as he does. Would that be Christian Rob Robin? Uh, yes, indeed. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah, have, have he, you, have uh, both of them have. You've interviewed him, Christian Robin, have you? No, I haven't. I do want to reach out to him, especially on the work that he's done on the Hemi rights in South Arabia. But I have interviewed uh, Mr. Michael McDonald, and that was a very, um, that, I really enjoyed that uh, podcast. Right. All right, so my first question, James, uh, you have a very interesting familial background, uh, family background. On another podcast, you have mentioned that your father's father, your grandfather, John Howard Johnston, was from New Hampshire in the United States, who also fought in the Civil War for the North, uh, made a fortune in South America, and ultimately retired to Europe. But on your mother's side, your her father, your grandfather, Field Marshal Douglas Haig, was something of a big shot here on the British Isles. Uh, he had studied ancient history at university and had quite an extensive and decorative military career. So I'm curious if your family background had anything to do with the direction you chose to go in concerning your academic career and uh, field of research. Well, I sort of yes and uh, yes and no. Um, when I finished my undergraduate studies at Oxford, uh, I was at something of a loss of, of what to do. And I have to confess that I was uh, having been in school all those years and then university, I was a bit nervous of going out into the world. So I decided to put it off. Now, in the end, I put it off for years and years and years and years. But at start, I put it off. And I thought, uh, I, I was a classicist, I'd read ancient history. And I, I thought, well, I'll do research in history, but in a less studied area. So I moved forwards from the classical period into late antiquity and the Middle Ages and uh, uh, to into Byzantine history. 
and then uh, trying to uh, deciding what aspect of Byzantine history to study. First, I thought of, of, of studying the Navy because my father was a naval officer in the British Navy. Mm -hmm. But then it turned out that two, uh, two scholars were already doing that. So I switched to the army. So in that's the sense in which the grandfather had some uh, had some influence, but of course he died long before I was born. He he died in the late twenties. Mm. Died remarkably young, I think, after the strain of after the strain of uh, command of you know the largest British army ever, about a million and a half men in the field in France. Well, you know, researching his background, he definitely left you with a lot of information for you to work with, as well as a lot of pictures and a very long Wikipedia page to read from. So uh, he seems like he was a very active and busy man for the short time that he did live. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and but throughout your career, James, you seem to have cultivated a number of interests in fields outside of the history of the Eastern Roman Byzantine Empire, such as an interest in, as you mentioned, the history of warfare, uh, the Eurasian steppe people, the Sassanid Empire, pre-Islamic Arabia and the advent of Islam. So my question is this, what drives you to continue to pursue research in, in, in your field, as well as in others, trying to tie them together and producing innovative ways of viewing the subjects you write about? Well, uh, I, it, there are two two drivers of that. First, um, in fact, it 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 makes it makes history much more interesting. If you you know you look outwards, it, it you may have got a focus on a particular field, but you've got to look out at the wider at the wider at the wider context. Uh, now, there are three drivers. The second is, of course, it's a very good way of sustaining interest when you shift from one thing to another to another. Now, there's a danger that you become rather yeah, your knowledge becomes rather thin if you do that. But if you, you do it regularly, slowly it builds up. <laughs> but the third and most important driver was teaching at Oxford. You see, at Oxford, uh, the basic form of teaching is not the lectures that are given, and, and they're given, but it's the individual uh, tuition in tutorials of one or two pupils at a time. And what the tutor does is uh, gives out a topic it gives out a reading list, may may give a short uh, remark or two about the subject and waits for a week for the pupil to have written an essay and then they discuss it. Now, tutors can't just concentrate on areas that they really know about. So they teach a much wider field and then they get feedback from the pupils and then they get excited and they start doing it. So I would say it's the it's the Oxford tutorial system, which is the prime driver of that, uh, that which, which may have meant that I um, have spread myself uh, more widely than uh, most of my contemporary Byzantinist colleagues. You know, sometimes I feel the same way. I have a wide variety of things I'm interested in, and I feel like because of that, I'll never be a master of one. I'll just be a jack of all trades. Or how, what's the saying? Jack of all trades, master of none. I'm but as I, as I get older, I feel like I kind of like the jack of all trades, master of none uh, moniker rather than just being pigeonholed in one oh, yeah. particular area of interest. Yeah, 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 yeah. And of course, in time, uh, you become the master of quite a lot of them. Not all, but of quite a lot of them. So I can't say that I'm a master of, of uh, Central Asian Turkish history. And even I ventured into Chinese history, and you know, and I just got, I've got sort of pockets of, of, of knowledge. Uh, but um, uh, of some others, like uh, uh, Armenia, Islam, Russia, uh, the Balkans. Um, I'm sort of reasonably, reasonably in command of things. Oh, and Iran. Oh, yes, Iran. Uh, um, yeah, L love Iran. Oh, I love Iran. Yeah. Definitely. No, Definitely. Iran in the past. Yeah, and I really, um, I mean, in your book, you have a lot of pictures that it looks like you took um, yourself while visiting Iran. And, uh, you know, I would have never expected, I mean, I'd never been there. And then a lot of what we hear about the Middle East coming from the media doesn't really capture the landscape or the cultures that, um, that, that you would see if you gone and visit those places. So uh, looking through your um, photos of places in Iran, especially the, uh, the, the, big, the big blank screen that Coast Road, yeah. Too. Uh -huh, yes. <laughs> no, that, that, that... Was almost the first place we, uh, the first time I went was in 1998 with a party from Oxford. 
and uh, we arrived sort of in the middle of the night and had a very short sleep, but then went by bus to the far west of Iran, to Takhti Suleiman, uh, well, to near Takhti Suleiman. So the first sight we, we saw was, ta was Takhti Suleiman, and then we came down uh, to Bisutun, and there I saw, is that while the others climbed up to see the, the uh, Darius monument, I was just gazing at this extraordinary screen. And it wasn't finished, right? It was, um, they started it. They they kind of started the, the etching of yes, the uh, figures. Yeah. No, they didn't, didn't even get as far as that. They were, they hadn't quite smoothed out the screen. Uh, so uh, basically they just created the space upon which hmm. to put some unknown uh, triumphant design about the victories of Khuzre II and the destruction of the Roman Empire, none of which came about. And no. it's slightly like, it, I'm sorry to, to, to go on about this, but in Mashhad, in the museum at Mashhad, uh, there is a, a huge uh, carpet which was being woven for the Kaiser in the First World War. And it's headed by uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the heading is Der Sieger, the, 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 the victor, within a list of, of battles. But the it was never sent because the war went wrong. You know? <laughs> well, you know, that's something that I, I think a lot of people can learn from uh, that, you know, don't count your eggs before they hatch. Uh, yes, yes, indeed. All right. And uh, go, moving on to your book, uh, The Last Great War of Antiquity, what inspired you to write The Last Great War of Antiquity? Exactly the same answer as I gave you for, for, for uh, uh, broadening out. It was pupils, it was teaching. Uh, at Oxford, uh, Peter Brown, of whom I'm sure you've heard, a great historian of late antiquity, who's uh, been in uh, the United States uh, since the uh, late 70s. And he's sort of the guru, the great guru of the subject. Um, Peter Brown, when he was at Oxford, uh, uh, with uh, a colleague, Dmitry uh, Obolensky, uh, established what was called a further subject, titled The Near East in the Age of Justinian and Mohammed. And from about, uh, from the early 70s, I began uh, uh, teaching this. And at its heart were, was the, the war between uh, uh, the great powers of the ancient world. So I was teaching it. And then I realized there was a certain amount to be done. And uh, about 30 years ago, I, the book, began as a date list. Is that what we find at the uh, beginning of your book with the, the, the timeline that you have? Is that is that what you started with? Uh, yes, but ex except the much shorter and full of errors. <laughs> I can imagine. Uh, so how does your book, The Last Great War of Antiquity, distinguish itself from other books on the subject? Uh, researching um, the contents of your book, uh, I come. I found out that there's not really much written on this particular event in uh, late antiquity between the Romans and the Persians. So, uh, with what else is out there, how does your book distinguish itself from the little that has been written? Well, basically, what has been written is either very general, so dealing with it in say fifty pages in the, in the course of a general history, um, or in one case, that of a retired, uh, I think he was a retired Greek general called Stratos, which means army, but maybe I'm, I'm imagining he was a retired general, but he just strung together sort of uh, material he'd taken from the Chronicles without too much thinking. Mm -hmm. so, um, so it's either very general or without really much analysis or with a lot of analysis, but focused on particular episodes. Mm -hmm. So in my view, so I think there was no general uh, scholarly uh, uh, history of the whole 30 year uh, episode. Uh, so I think mine, mine is the first, the first. Okay, one. wow. 
Wow, that that I hope that inspires more uh, people, uh, inspire inclines people to read your book, being that it's the first, because uh, you won't find anything like that. As uh, you've cited other books, uh, Walter uh, Kirgi, if I pronounce his last name right, uh, but he only focuses on one aspect of that situation, while yours it encompasses the the whole situation involving more than just a single side. Yes, indeed, and and he's very focused on the 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 the, the figure of the Emperor Heraclius. Uh, uh, there's a certain, and there's a certain amount of conjecture in his, uh, as there has to be in his bi biography because of the, the, the uh, dearth of sources. But um, he, he's not that much interested or doesn't say much about the Iranian, uh, the Iranian side. And um, and I think for you know on 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 sort of strategy and the background, social and economic conditions of the Middle East. Uh, the Roman side and the Persian side, all of that is, uh, you know, drops out, out of the way because he was writing a biography. And moving on to sources, what were some of the primary sources that you drew upon to write The Last Great War of Antiquity and what challenges did you face when using them? The, um, I think one of, one of my uh, sort of long lasting concerns is to try to identify document-based information in literary sources. You see ancient historians in the Greek and Roman worlds, uh, when they were writing history, they were really writing literature. So they did their utmost to conceal uh, the sources that they used. But as we come into towards late antiquity, sometimes we catch a, we catch a glimpse of them and we catch a glimpse of whole documents underlying a text. Now, in the case of the last, for the last great war of antiquity, um, a, uh, a, 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 a long, um, uh, good chronicle written in the early ninth century uh, by a very grand monk, Theophanes, uh, has an account of the last great war. And one can see lurking within it whole uh, chunks of material taken from Heraclitus's dispatches from the field. And one can demonstrate this because in another source, the Easter Chronicle, which was finished probably in 630, Heraclitus's last dispatch is reproduced whole. Mm. And one can see the way the material in Theophanies uh, uh, dovetails with the material in uh, the Easter Chronicle. And the whole manner of exposition is the same. And then you find there's more underlying it. Uh, then in addition to that, in the Easter Chronicle, a, a lot of it consists of short uh, notices, which are like court notices or, you know, little notices issued by governments to say what, what has changed. And, and of course, when one thinks about it, any organized state uh, uh, um, uh, needs to keep its officials uh, serving in distant, dis in distant provinces, and indeed the people at large, aware of what is happening at the center. And, you, and the center needs to know what is happening in the provinces. So it, 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 what the center informs them in, in the form of little communiques, and uh, the provinces, you write reports or generals write dispatches. So my view is that underlying an enormous amount of ancient history, there is documentary material, which we can't see mm. because they're all, they're all fine writers. The one exception is uh, the historian Tacitus of uh, the High Roman Empire um, covering the first century AD. Tacitus was a senator and it's, it can be demonstrated. He made extensive use of the senatorial archives. Um, so uh, I'm simply generalizing that. Okay. And for our period, what's wonderful is that the writers are less, uh, they're less keen on fine writing. They're more keen on basically presenting the truth. Mm -hmm. And so we can see them more clearly. And then when you start looking, you find them elsewhere. There's uh, an important Armenian source. And that gets us at, uh, we, we can get Persian documents from it. And that's the history of Kozrov. That's right, that's right. And that leads me to my next question. Um, from what I understand after reading your book, most of the sources you're dealing with for this period are non-Iranian and seem to be unsympathetic to the Persian cause. 
how do you how were you able to see through whatever fabrications existed the exaggerations and polemics in order to provide an even-handed account of this final war between the romans and persians you have to work quite hard at it but luckily um the armenian you see the armenians uh i mean armenian now is reduced to a, a sort of rump of what it once was uh, in the area of the transcaucasus Armenia was the uh, the sort of big, uh, uh, the largest. They were the largest of the peoples, straddling the Roman and the Persian spheres. And they, indeed, they were partitioned for much of late antiquity. And the greater part of Armenia was in this Persian sphere. And so you get, uh, through Armenian sources, you get a, a, an in, inside view of uh, the Sasanian Empire of Iran at the time. And despite uh, the, the sympathies of the two principal Armenian sources dealing with the last great war, despite their sympathy, because they were Christians, their sympathies for the Romans, uh, they, they, give, uh, they pres preserve a lot of material, which gives one an insight into uh, the Iranian world. And otherwise one has to, one has to delve back into the past and into other sources to 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 uh, to to get at it, but, and of course to travel there, mm -hmm. and have a sense of 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 the of of the, of the country, um, but but basically it quite it's quite hard work to read from uh, you know use a slanted source to get to get rid of the bias and to try to see what lies what lies behind it. Yeah, because I feel like that's the problem. Uh, many people working in Islamic studies or dealing with the early history of Islam are faced with is how do you reconcile uh, the sources that have exaggeration, polemics, um, fabrications, as well as the truth. Um, but how do you extract um, and take out some of those um, some of those things that might be present in them in order to create a coherent, chronologically sound uh, narrative, which is something it seems like you accomplished in this book, which really, for me, gives hope to Islamicists who are hoping to do the same thing when they write early histories on, uh, say, Muhammad or, or Muslims after him. Yes, well, I think, think can we digress just a bit? Yes, of course. On, on that. Um, uh, I, um, I, uh, um, I, I certainly believe that by using non-Islamic sources, one can test, in fact, the pre-Islamic history, which is presented by uh, the Islamic sources. So I, I really take exception with the view which was current in the late 20th century, that there was a great deal of... Um, looking you know rewriting the past because of the concerns of the present and embroider embroidering it it seemed to me it has always seemed to me that the events of the seventh century were so extraordinary and so important to the faithful that it was inconceivable that people would be playing around with it so i take the view that on the core events of the prophet's life there's no question that 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 that, that was tampered with by by sub by subsequent subsequent writers. Um, uh, you know, every historian, when they're looking at the past, is of course they're trapped in their own present, but they have to try to get out of the present into the past. And then, if uh, as we were talking about, if they if if the, if the sources enable them to get into one bit of the past, they then got to try to get out of that <laughs> into another into another bit of it. And uh, so uh, I'm sure we will we will we'll come on to this, but um, I, I think that the Islamicists of the late 20th century are being superseded by Islamicists of the 21st century, uh, some of whom um, uh, uh, I taught, um, uh, notably uh, Ed Zikovich Coghill, and uh, and uh, Andrew Andy Marsham. Uh, um, but there's also Sean Anthony in the United in the United States, who are extracting real history out of the early uh, out of the early materials. Um, uh, a task which, in the late twentieth century, um, people thought him, it thought it impossible to distinguish between what was spurious or embroidered, and what was uh, faithful. To reality. 
Yeah, I've, I've heard from other academics who are trying to write a, a narrative history of uh, early Islam saying that getting over the skepticism of the 70s is a very difficult task concerning the sources. But um, as you mentioned, it seems like uh, people are moving in another direction. It's, it's good. It's good. It's I believe so. And I bet you it's good for you because you classify yourself a, a traditionalist in a sense of dealing with sources uh, to where you don't believe that. Um, I'm not saying that you don't believe that maybe fa pious fabrications or exaggerations didn't creep in. But for the most part, um, they're still telling um, the essence of what is being told is still historical. Exactly. Exactly. And um, I will. Uh, guide people or or plug in your uh talk the quran as a historical source because you mentioned six scenes from sixth century uh arabian political history that the quran talks about and when looking at the um what was written about those in extra ex extraneous literature it seems pretty i don't want to say accurate but it seems like they came pretty close to describing the event as it's understood from other sources yes yes uh, absolutely and I should just say, going back to uh, trying to get at the Iranian view of things, which we, we were talking about, that, of course, it's uh, early Islamic sources. They receive a lot more from Iran uh, than uh, so we don't have contemporary Iranian sources, but we have later material in these Islamic sources. And they basically give us an account. Basically, it's court focused. It's focused on the great figures and the court. And so they give us something of the flavor of Iranian of Iranian history. And this is in Tabari, in Al Tabari, and then later in the great uh, uh, Iranian epic, uh, Firdaus's Shalami. Okay. Yeah, uh, Al Tabari is uh, one of my favorite historians from uh, the Islamic world. I really, uh, I have uh, half of his uh, great history. Um, I know it's like 30 volumes, but I managed to, you know, grab 15 of them. And I really enjoy his work. I mean, he gives you everything from the sources he has, and then he gives you his opinion, which uh, I found to be very different from other contemporaries of his. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. And different from all classical historians, except possibly the first of them, Herodotus, mm -hmm. who would also give different opinions and then give his own. All right, and going back to the last great war of antiquity, because I can talk about Islamic sources all, all day, to be honest, because um, I find them very interesting and trying to figure out how to use them in order to create a uh, real history. But setting the stage, um, we already talked about two of the main actors, um, uh, the, the Persians and the, the Romans and the Persians. But uh, let, let's focus on them first. Uh, who are the Eastern Byzantine Romans? And why do we use this distinction Eastern and Byzantine to describe them? And did they see themselves in the East as being different from its counterpart in the West? Uh, because I feel like these terminologies can be very confusing for people. Uh, you're, you're, yes. The um, the terminologies are uh, the products of scholars looking at the field and trying to divide it up. Uh, the East Romans were Romans. Uh, they'd uh, uh, they'd lost control over the West in the late fifth century, but then in the sixth century, the Emperor Justinian, through a series of um, sort of probing expeditions, uh, manages to recover much of North Africa. Uh, Italy and some of Spain. So in the sixth century, it's back ag again to being a Roman empire, uh, uh, straddling the whole Mediterranean. Then in the late sixth century, a uh, ground is lost in Italy to the Lombards. Mm. Um, uh, North Africa is all right. It, it's, all right. It, uh, um, uh, it's, it's reasonably stable. Uh, there, there were pressures from without, from Berbers. Um, uh, where they were really losing ground was in the Balkans, but they're still Roman. So they've got the Roman constitution, Roman culture. Uh, they've got the East, the language of the East had always been Greek. The language of the West was Latin. So Greek is becoming, becoming, becoming more important. So they're basically Romans and they go all the way back to the early empire and then before that to the Republic. So mm -hmm. continuous history, continuous development from, you know, the sixth century BC, fifth century BC. And would that be the same for the Persians, the Sasanians, being that the, Par the Parthians were before them? Were they a continuation of the Parthians? 
Uh, they yes, they were, but they they were rebels against the the Parthians. Um, they basically saw themselves as restoring uh, the Persians proper. Now Persians proper come from, uh, you know, sorry, Persia proper is a particular region within Iran, on the edge of the Zagros, uh, uh, centered on um, uh, basically where, where Persepolis. Uh, where where, Perse where Persepolis is, so it's um, it's basically southern uh, southeastern uh, southeastern Iran. Persepolis is the capital Cyrus established. Uh, uh, the, the the great pat yes indeed yes indeed, and then then there's that wonderful site of uh, of Pasargadi where Cyrus's tomb stands up, and you can see it silhouetted against against the landscape. So it's the area. So it, you know, Isfahan is 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 there. Um, uh, I, I'm trying to think what the um, uh, the chief city. I suppose Isfahan is probably the chief city. The, uh, the chief the chief city now. So basically, it was a resurgence of Persian proper, Persia mm -hmm. proper, and uh, the the small dynasty based there, which was both uh, uh, aristocratic and the, the Zoroastrian priesthood. It engages in a campaign which gathers uh, strength as it uh, proceeds and succeeded in uh, imposing their authority over the whole of Iran and then over what, what it, much of what is now Iraq in about 20 years in the early third century. And they were consciously uh, restoring a great Iran. But the funny thing against the Parthians, uh, the Parthian, Parthian state was rather loosely organized and was you know occasionally was beaten by the romans um so they were it, this was a stronger more centralized uh iranian uh, state and they're re recreating something great that had pre uh, that had, uh, had existed before the parthians but funnily they didn't have a clear view of the achaemenid empire the great achaemenid empire of the sixth and fifth uh and fourth centuries uh, a.d they sort of uh, that got subsumed into an imaginary Kyanid empire, which mm. was even greater and even more powerful. But they're recreating the past, so there's continuity on the Iranian side as well. Okay, uh, and the Sasanians they were more militaristic than uh, because of their geographical location. They they had to be militaristic. Is that am I understanding that correctly? Uh, because they have they're basically they're caught between. Uh, the Romans, the Roman Empire, which is a militaristic power, uh, though re relatively stable and not expansionist in late antiquity, uh, they're caught between them and uh, the the greater uh, nomad powers that it were uh, emerged within the steppes to the north and the east of Iran, and I'd say that I Iran uh, is a principal. Uh, uh, the problem came from the north and the east. So it came from Huns uh, and their successors, Kidarites, and their successors, Hephthalites, and their successors, uh, uh, Turks, uh, who established their authority over much of Central Asia, where, um, so it's, it's, ex, it's now ex-Soviet Central Asia, where there were major city, major cities um, so it's it's a it's not just nomads; it's nomads and sedentaries and great trading cities. So the great power in their own in their own right. So the, the Iran, Sasanian Iran, had to cope with them, and cope with the Romans. And, you know, I really didn't know how powerful the Central Asians and steppe people were until I had read a book by uh, Fred Frederick S. Starr, um, the uh, the Lost Golden Age, where he gives the pre-Islamic history of Central Asia. And you had mentioned in your book that the Sogdians had had uh, helped the uh, or the the Turkish cagnet was um, involved with Sogdians and others. They, 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 in effect, they co-opted. Uh, the the, the uh, elites of the Sogdian cities, and there are numerous cities, uh, large uh, trading cities, and these are basically mercantile elites. So they're sort of co-opted into running uh, the the Turkish Khaganate. And the Sogdians had trade connections, you know, with the with the Far East, you know, uh, 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 with India in the south, with the north, 
and with with the West, though uh, the Sasanian merchants, of course, were rather suspicious of them. <laughs> And so that creates tension. Okay, so uh, we just introduced another actor, the Turkish cognate, who was seemed to be a thorn in the side of the Sasanians, or some or a group of people the Sasanians were definitely uh, weary about. Um, now moving further uh, west, we have the Avars, who are um, antagonistic to the Romans, or the Romans are having trouble with the with the Avars. Yes, they were the Avars established themselves in what's now Hungary. Uh, the, the, the Avars, it, it looks as if the Avars were, uh, they defeated uh, the great power of the East Asian steppes, the Juan Juan, uh, uh, who, whom the Turks uh, uh, defeated and superseded. And this is a little fragment of that world that's fled west and ended up fairly safe behind the Carpathian Mountains uh, in Hungary. And they then take over, establish their authority over the Slavs who were moving into the Balkans. Okay. So they were, they're a major power from the uh, antagonist of the Romans, but not on nothing like the same level as the Turks, as mm. an antagonist of the Iranians. Which will explain uh, what will which will explain a topic we'll get to later on why um, the Persians felt the way they did about the Romans uh, after after uh, focus had got toppled. But um, okay, so my next question: uh, You start your book with Kosro II. Mm -hmm. He was disposed. He was deposed from his throne during a civil war that broke out in 590, but later regained it with the help of the emperor Maurice, who had troops sent in order to defeat Khosrow. Now, what was the relationship it's between to defeat the usurper Bara? Yeah, it's usurper it's Bara. Sorry, uh, I, I stopped reading uh, halfway through my uh, sentence. <laughs> but um, you know, I'm curious. What was the relationship between the Romans and the Persians? Because a lot of times we see them as just unending conflict between each other. But they had a little bit different of uh, they had a different relationship than just warring against each other. But they seeing each other as uh, seeing each other's existence as necessary for stability in the world can you uh, explain that type of relationship that they had between each other well um i suppose you can see an analogy even if you have two great powers uh and uh, if they acknowledge that they basically can't defeat and destroy the other uh, they have to coexist so it's a period of coexistence now that happened uh, there basically was about 120 years of relatively peaceful coexistence from the late uh, um, the late fourth century to the early sixth century from uh, the 380s uh, through to uh, uh, 500 uh, which was just punctuated by a couple of a couple of crises which were relatively rapidly uh, uh, diffused uh, so uh, then uh, th relations deteriorate in the seventh century, but still the underlying assumption on both sides is the other is a permanent fixture and that it's a, a near equal, um, even if they're uh, fighting each other. Now, the reason for them uh, fighting each other, I mean, it's, it starts off uh, because of a Shah Carvard uh, who basically was a client of the then dominant nomad people to the east, the Hephthalites. And I think he's trying to establish uh, himself and a greater degree of in independence and uh, improve his standing among Iranians by launching an unprovoked war of aggression on the Romans in autumn 502. So that then uh, triggers a, a series of conflicts uh, where the, um, the uh, on the whole, after that first one, uh, the aggression, uh, no, the, 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 the initiative shifts from side to side. So it's sort of tit for tat warfare with periods of peace in between. And they, they can, can construct elaborate peace treaties uh, to, govern, to govern their relations. So basically they accept each other, uh, they have uh, differences, uh, different interests, 
they're able of uh, they're able to reconcile them, but they um, uh, conflicts break out, and the conflicts tend to get worse with time, and last longer. But uh, we uh, in, in the uh, during Kosovo's two reign, um, Maurice had helped him when uh had helped him when he was dealing with the civil war in his realm uh at the same time uh maurice when a general who was in the balkans was dissatisfied with what was happening in their situation he came to overthrow maurice and kosro too came to uh to his rescue do you believe that was a legitimate because you do talk about this in your book do you believe that was genuine um you know genuine did do you believe he genuinely wanted to help the romans or did he, or do you think he saw an opportunity to regain maybe some territory or something that was lost from a previous time i know i'm jumping over some things but uh if you if you can just lay that out for me in in a uh, cuz no you see there there, there was a, basically a 10 year uh, period of peace which uh, between uh, the restoration of kuzro and uh, the uh, deposition and uh, execution of Maurice, uh, 591 uh, to uh, six, 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 602, so over 10 years. Uh, why? Uh, well, it was a perfect pretext for Kuzro uh, to intervene. And uh, he had good reason to intervene because Maurice did extract some substantial territorial concessions in return for restoring Kuzro. So Kuzro is plainly after um, uh, getting those back and uh, going back to the old uh, uh, Persian Roman frontier. So uh, I would say that Iranian state interests were prime, but there's a perfect excuse for intervening. Uh, so the war uh, is very much uh, Iranian uh, initiated, uh, beginning in spring six oh three, and it's uh, and I would view it as a uh, as I think I say in the title a war of a war of um, revenge. You know, and I have uh, just a few more questions concerning Maurice and Focus. Now, if Focas didn't rebel against Maurice. Do you think that maybe another Roman general would have? Because um, uh, an another general in his arm or another participant in his military would have, being that they were exhausted from being so far away from their home, they weren't satisfied. Do, do you believe that uh, if Focas had hadn't rebelled against Maurice, that another uh, someone else would have? Well, yes, because it was a general army mutiny. Mm. In Balkans. Um, and so it's a, a bad uh, misjudgment by Morris and his regime that uh, they could keep on uh, uh, keep on sort of increasing the pressure on the Slavs and the Avars, uh, because what really triggers it is when the army is told to winter north of the Danube, so further away from uh, from from Roman uh, territory. Uh, so, but so the ultimate cause of it is, I suppose, mis misjudgment as well as, you know, and the, the great strain on the troops in the field. And Focas, he, he reigns for, um, how, how long does Focas reign from 602 to <laughs> six, to, uh, 610, November, uh, yeah, 610, October 610. But in 68, we see the rise of another Roman general, Heraclius. And where does Heraclius come from? He seems to have came out of nowhere, even as you mentioned in your book, his biography is uh, is very sketchy. Um, we don't have complete information. Uh, you know, it's only been it's been uh, three years since your book came out, just about. I wonder, do we know a little bit more about Heraclius now than when you were writing it? Or is his background still somewhat of a, a, a mystery? It remains something of a mystery. There clearly is a connection with Cappadocia uh, in Asia Minor, uh, in the center of Asia Minor in, in modern Turkey. There's some connection, but, uh, and we know that his father was one of the, not the first rank generals, but second rank generals uh, and successful serving the Emperor Maurice. And at some point he was appointed uh, uh, governor 
of North Africa called Exarch with uh, civil as well as military uh, powers. And uh, so Heraclius Senior is uh, in, in the uh, the leading rebel at first. So it's a rebellion by Heraclius Senior and Heraclius Junior. Uh, we know that there were some connections with the West because a um, relation of the Emperor Heraclius is, uh, who who uh, uh, who later rebelled has got a uh, a, 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 a Frankish a, a Germanic name. So that's some sort there's some sort of G G Germanic connection, but basically uh, the rebellion. Uh, I mean the, the position of uh, the young Heraclius is as son of his father, who is governor of North Africa, far away from Constantinople, where they were able to gradually build up a coalition of support uh, from Berber, uh, Berbers and uh, 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 Romans in North Africa, and beginning to uh, then begin to undermine uh, the Phocas regime uh, on the approaches uh, to Egypt. So basically, it's a, uh, uh, and clearly they were in, also in touch with uh, the Senate in Constantinople. Now, the Senate normally is viewed as a sort of powerless entity, just a sort of husk of uh, the the republic, uh, well, the early imperial Senate or Republican Senate, but occasionally it would assume power, and certainly uh, symbolically, it was important that they had the support of the Senate. And so they declare their ambitions at first by, by becoming, uh, by assuming the title of consul. Mm. And what, what, what is the strategic importance of Egypt? It seems like that was the first place Heraclius went, but in many other battles, it seems like Egypt was of strategic importance for the beginning of, um, the beginning of uh, many conquests. So what was the strategic importance of Egypt and why does it seem like that's the first place that people would want to take over before expanding anywhere else? Well, in the case of North Africa, of course, it's uh, its neighbor uh, to the east, but, uh, Egypt was uh, agriculturally and industrially by far the richest province of the of the Roman world, and Egypt was relatively secure because um, it could only be attacked across the Sinai Desert. You know, once you control the, 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 its western approaches, you just got a small, uh, a, you know, small uh, uh, the area to defend on uh, the um, which is the Sinai Desert uh, approaches. So it's a perfect base from which then to start destabilizing uh, the, uh, the Roman Empire in the East. And, uh, so, and what I think happened was that, uh, that the rebel movement first, they got hold of Alexandria uh, pretty quickly, Alexandria on the coast of Egypt. And there uh, Heraclius and his cousin Nikitas parted ways. Nikitas was left with the task of basically conquering Egypt and then securing Egypt against a counterattack, which he did, while Heraclius disappears. And in my view, he disappears because he's got the fleet and he's going off to Cyprus. And Cyprus was the key base from which he set about undermining the regime of Phocas throughout uh, uh, the Middle East and what's now Turkey, Asia Minor. And he was he set off uh, to sail to attack Constantinople in summer, late summer, six ten. And during all these events, Persia were were I'm, I'm pretty sure they were privy to all these things that were happening in Roman politics. And uh, do you believe th this all may have been the root cause to why Persia was able to have much success in battles? Um, I ask that question because. You know, when I look at the early Islamic history, they had uh, numerous civil wars that happened at the same time that they were expanding uh, out. Yeah, yeah. So I wonder if, um, I mean, I, even though that wasn't the case, I mean, I, I'm actually wondering, is that the case with the uh, with, with the Romans? Even though they were having these civil wars, did that make did did that put them in a weak position that open that opened them up for uh, for Persia to have successful battles yes. against them? Yes, I mean, they fought. The Roman troops fought very, very hard, uh, so that the, the Persians basically they advance in small steps 
uh, over Armenia and into uh, northern Mesopotamia and northern Syria. Uh, so basically, it took them eight years to reach the Mediterranean. Now, uh, but there were two moments of great weakness uh, when they made significant gains. The first was when, at, at the time of the Focas coup d'état, um, uh, so their the initial successes uh, occurred then. And then it's at the time, it's basically in 610, when I think the whole Roman world is distracted by the drama that's about to, to unfold. And that's the point at which they cross the Euphrates and they uh, march to the Mediterranean and they divide the Roman Empire in two. And, and, uh, the, and from thereafter, they could make quite rapid advances south over Syria, Palestine, and eventually Egypt. And so the uh, first place that the Persians attack would be Dara. That's right. And uh, when they attack Dara, Dara falls, and that leads to many other successive uh, sweep, sweeping battles throughout the region. Um, when, when does, uh, matter of fact, I'm sorry, moving backwards. Heraclius and Focus, what happens between Heraclius and Focus? How does Heraclius tend, uh, topple Focus? Was it a difficult uh, matter for him? Did Focus have a strong backing of the Roman people or did Heraclius have uh, more of the people on his side to make that possible? Because it seems like um, Focus wasn't, Focus didn't seem like he, Focus seems like he had, uh, sorry, I'm mincing my words. Focus seems like he had a lot of people uh, against him that made it possible for his overthrow to happen for someone like Heraclius to just come out of nowhere and, and make that possible. Yeah, obviously Focus had a lot of backing and Focus had, was, was a pretty successful general. I mean, the, the Romans, uh, the, uh, the Roman defense is pretty impressive given all the circumstances. Um, and Phocas made peace with the Avars, transferred troops to, uh, to uh, Asia Minor, to the Eastern Fronts, uh, despite the rebellion of the Supreme Commander in uh, uh, northern, northern Syria, uh, he, stabilizes, he stabilizes the position. So basically, uh, the loss of Dara occurs during the time of trouble. Now, Phocas... So, so Focas, uh, yes, I mean, he gets a very, very bad press from our sources, which were all written after Heraclius had taken, had taken power. Um, but on the other hand, uh, they wrote, they, 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 um, uh, there was a column in his honor erected in Rome. So, you know, he's well, he's, he, he, we can see signs that he was well regarded. So why, how was he over, uh, toppled relatively easily? Uh, when Heraclius's fleet uh, uh, approached, well, I think it's a combination of intensive anti-Focas propaganda, which had been going on for two years, uh, then the effects uh, and the effects of military and naval action on uh, the provinces of uh, the Middle East, um, and uh, basically Heraclius had key supporters inside Constantinople, so the. The seizure of the city, the capture of Phocas and his execution, they were all done without any sort of serious um, uh, problem encountered. Okay. And this happens in uh, 610, Phocas is deposed. October 610. And so from the period between 610 and 613, uh, what was Heraclius doing? Were there, was there any battles between the Persians and Heraclius? Or as I remember from your book, Heraclius being that he deposed Phocas, uh, and Phocas was the reason for why Khosrow II uh, moved on Rome. Um, were there any skirmishes between Heraclius and Khosrow II between the time of 610 and 613? Or was Heraclius just trying to make concessions with Khosrow II because he had deposed or he had taken out the reason for why Khosrow moved on Rome in the first place? Now, Heraclius, on his seizure of power, of course, sent ambassadors to Khosrow to uh, announce his accession and presumably to try to make peace. They were executed. So there was no diplomacy. Uh, there was military action because in uh, uh, 611, uh, where, where, there, where there had been re resistance to Heraclius' regime in Asia Minor, 
uh, the Persian army in Armenia uh, crossed the Euphrates and came into Cappadocia in Central Asia Minor and occupied uh, the capital, Caesarea, where they basically stayed. They were there for, for a year, threatening the whole of, a of, of, whole of Asia Minor. Um, and Heraclius um, paid a visit to, to the blockaders, but the Persians then defeated the blockaders and escaped in 612. So that was a bad blow to the new regime. Mm. Then Heraclius takes the field, as does his cousin Nikitas. Nikitas comes up from Egypt, Heraclius comes down from Asia Minor, and they try to, uh, they attack from the south and the north, uh, the Persian uh, bridgehead in northern Syria, uh, you know, going from Antioch to the sea, and they were defeated. And uh, Heraclius's army withdraws in good order, but withdraws uh, back uh, through Cilicia into Asia Minor uh, uh, and back. So it was, just, it was a failure, mm -hmm. not a disastrous failure, but a failure. And uh, enabled the Persians then, as well as the Iranians, to concentrate and strengthen their position in northern Syria and to prepare for uh, campaigns to the south against the weaker part of the Roman Empire. And so when does Heraclius come in and try to make concessions with the with with the Persian? Is this is, is what you just described afterwards or 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 this before? Oh, and it's quite a long before. He 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 offers these huge concessions, or rather the Senate offers them on his behalf in mm. 615, um, late summer, early autumn 615, after um uh, something else has happened after the fall of jerusalem which i just kind of passed over sorry i kind of uh i do have my notes here and i might have skipped over too much so uh before we talk about the concessions that the senate made in heraclius's name let's talk about the fall of jerusalem or the battle of antioch in 613 that's really what i was trying to get to between 610 and 613 which is why i felt like i was a little bit confused with what i was saying so um the battle of antioch which is a devastating blow to the Roman army, uh, and and we hear about and we hear about this. Uh, many Muslims will know we hear about this described in the Quran. Uh, the Romans have been defeated. Can you describe what kind of effect this defeat had on the Roman world and its surroundings? Because uh, I ask that question because a lot of Muslims or a lot of people who are familiar with Islamic history they hear uh, the Romans have been defeated and they think that it was just something that was that Muhammad had known about um, uh, somehow. But it seems like this information sent shock throughout the whole of the the Near East and its surroundings. Right now, the Battle of Antioch. Uh, that you're talking about is the same as the battle I've just I've, I was just describing, where you've got the attempt to squeeze out, uh, to to destroy the bridgehead attacks from the south and from the from the north in 613. Now um, I don't think it was it it wasn't a disastrous defeat for the Romans. It was a defeat, mm. as I said, and Heraclius withdraws in good order. I don't think that is the defeat uh, to which uh, 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 allusion is made. In the Quran, mm. the Romans were defeated, but uh, for the simple reason that the event that did, we know, spread uh, and cause shock uh, throughout the world was the fall of Jerusalem to the Persians in 614. So personally, I would say that it's that and that would have gone to, you know, all the Christians in Arabia and uh, uh, Muhammad and uh, the Quraysh. Uh, in, in in Mecca, they would have become well aware of it because of all their trade connections with the north. I'm sure it's the fall of Jerusalem. And of course, you can see that in the long run, that would have much greater resonance because of it being the holy city. And that's why, of course, within the, within the Christian world, uh, it really reverberated. 
And the one thing that I would like to point out is that in the Persian realm, the Sasanians, they had a large number of Christians who uh, were living in relative, uh, relatively peaceful lives. How did they respond to the fall of Jerusalem to the Persians? Uh, do we have Im any information on anything, any anything that was going around? Uh, were they uh, enthused about it? Were they upset about it? Uh, did they have no position? Or uh, are the sources silent about um, this this aspect of that community? Yes, we, we, the sources are not good uh, for the Christians. Uh, that were divided between two confessions in uh, in, Mesopot in Mesopotamia. But what we do know is that the uh, the the Persian authorities were very very careful uh, to uh, not to antagonize uh, uh, the Christians of uh, Palestine. Uh, so um, the I mean they'd intervened to prevent uh, a pogrom of Jews in Jerusalem. Uh, that, that's what, what led to the siege and the fall of the city. Um, uh, 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 but, and of course they got a huge Jewish constituency also in Mesopotamia. So they had to strike a balance. And, um, and so uh, uh, and that they did. I mean, they basically they did, they, there wasn't wholesale slaughter uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, for three days after the fall of the city, um, the the the, uh, the Persian army was sort of hunting, uh, hunting uh, you know resistance in the city, and considerable damage was done to the churches, but it's not a wholesale bloody sack. Then order is restored, and uh, uh, and uh, certain categories of people uh, were deported. So the church authorities. Um, those with useful trades and those identified as uh, particular troublemakers in, in relation between Christians and Jews. So then uh, 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 the, uh, the, the, the deportees are then taken off under escort to Iraq. Now with the deportees goes the patriarch of the city and the fragments of uh, the cross, mm -hmm. uh, relic of the cross. Uh, but the relic of the cross is then um, uh, uh, treasured by the Christians of Iraq. Is it wow? Uh, so so and they so they had the they had the true cross for a bit in the the Christians in Iraq. Okay, yes. wow. And, and 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 what then the Persian forces did was, after sorting out the problems of the city, they withdrew in six fourteen back to Caesarea of uh, Palestine, on the coast. And they 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 basically kept their distance for uh, nearly two years. They then returned, basically, to restore order into into Palestine, where uh, the Arab tribes of the fringe were beginning to raid and cause disorder, and also to um, re-establish a balance between Christians and Jews in Jerusalem. That basically they forbade more immigration by Jews who weren't resident in the city, into the city. They wanted to maintain the status quo. So mm -hmm. what one sees there is the way that uh, the Sasanian regime had to tread quite carefully when it came to religious, not necessarily minorities, but you know, important religious constituencies within the state. And, um, and I think that was the, what basically forced them along with the raiding, a disorder, uh, to take control of pa the whole of Palestine in 616. Okay, and before we get to the concessions that were rejected by Kosovo II, I do want to add that it seems like there was a, a considerable amount of anti-Semitism in the in the Roman sources because it seemed like they believed that the Persians and the Jews were uh, working, working together. Yes, uh, it was, um, and of course, I mean, there was grounds for that. In, I mean, grounds for that belief, because of course the Persians had intervened to protect the Jewish community. Um, uh, and yes, uh, there is there is, there there are a series of rather unpleasant uh, uh, um, uh, uh, touches uh, to the Roman Roman material. And indeed, at the end of the war, Heraclius instituted a concerted effort to convert Jews. 
to Christianity. Uh, uh, not, not involving persecution, but pressure. Yeah. And so uh, now on to the concession after the fall of Jerusalem and concessions are made to Kosro II on behalf of uh, Heraclius by the Senate. Uh, and Kosro II, and th these concessions that were uh, made to Kosro II were restoring what he had lost uh, when he was, or when uh, Maurice had helped him. Uh, they were going to give him back more than what was taken from him uh, in that time. And he rejected that. Yes. Uh, no, it, it's sure, really, I mean, we don't know uh, exactly what the territorial concessions would be, but almost certainly. Uh, he would have got very substantial territorial concessions. I mean, all basically, most of the territory that he'd 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 gained by that by that stage. Uh, but yet more important, uh, the the Romans um, the Roman Senate uh, 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 asked Cusro to nominate the Roman emperor, so the Roman emperor would become a a, a nominee of uh, the Shah and Shah, and they simply recommended Heraclius, uh, but Khosrow um, uh, could have nominated whoever whoever he wanted. So in effect, the Roman Emperor, uh, the Roman Empire uh, was being offered as a client state, mm. the Persian Empire, and that was rejected by Khosrow. And what were the implications behind this? Because uh, before that, the Romans and the Persians, as we mentioned earlier, they had a certain type of relational, uh, they had a certain type of relationship to where they kind of worked hand in hand, even though they had conflicts periodically. But what were the implications behind Khosrow rejecting uh, these concessions and vassalage? Uh, well, of course, vassalage would have, ch would have changed it quite dramatically. Uh, because and and I I would envisage that Khosrow uh, 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 would have ex extended the direct Persian rule to the Mediterranean, would then have exercised suzerainty over uh, Asia Minor, uh, while the uh, Avars and Slavs are probably overrunning the Balkans. So you'd have a very small rump Roman state. That, that's that's what I would envisage. Now when Heraclius when Khosrow rejects this, he's rejecting this whole scenario, and it must be for only one reason, because he wishes to basically to liquidate the Roman Empire. Which before that was unheard of, of a Persian yeah. ruler trying to accomplish. Yeah. And, um, and, and the reason for that, I think, is to be found in what was happening in Central Asia, where the, Turk, the Turkish Khaganate, having been through a period of, uh, of crisis, was begin, was reasserting itself, and indeed had done so or did so in the very year of these negotiations, six fifteen, and basically it, it was uh, Khosrow was wanting to eliminate the Western problem so as to be able to deal properly with the Eastern one. You know, I have to say, I came out uh, out of uh, I, when I was finished with your book. I kind of liked Khosrow too a bit. I, I I found like I felt like his mind was always working. He was thinking a few steps ahead, even though it kind of led to uh, his downfall. But I really felt like uh, he 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 was demonstrating some type of political. Uh, he was a political genius. It, it seems like. Oh yes, oh yes. He achieved he achieved more than any of his Sasanian predecessors. Yeah, he he re, it seems like he restored the the Persian Empire uh, back to its Achaemenid uh, glory. Yes, indeed. Um, so he is a giant figure in the the epic history of Iran that you get in Firdausi's Shahnameh. Okay, and so uh, concessions have been rejected. What uh, from there? Where where does the Roman Empire? What does the Roman Empire do? They're in a they're in a weak position. They've suffered uh, numerous defeats at the hands of the Persian. Um, in this period, we see a reorganization of the of 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 the Roman Empire at the hands of Heraclius. He made certain he uh, made certain reorganize uh, he reorganized the economy uh, and because this part right here I'm not uh, I was a bit confused or I read through it but you know economics really isn't my thing can you describe 
in what way did Heraclius reorganize the economy in order to kind of stimulate uh, a war effort against uh, Persia? Um, it, well, I think it's more he re reorganizes the administration. Uh, it, it basically, uh, it, it become, I mean, it, it's now quite a small state, so he centralizes everything, uh, but above all the finances. Um, he um, melts down quite a lot of the church plate. Uh, he's basically uh, getting, basically gathering uh, as much power as possible into the center and so as to maximize the, the resources available for the state. There was nothing much he could do about the economy at this stage because, you know, it's already, uh, you know, in this, uh, in these conditions of war and loss of territory in the Middle East, um, I don't think that commerce, uh, uh, commerce, and uh, you know such manufacturing as went on in Asia Minor, uh, th th there was no way he could really boost it. it. I mean, the commerce clearly had declined dramatically. So it's making do with the resources to hand. So making the state machine as efficient as possible. That that he does do in those following years, but in the military field, I mean, there's. There, there, we hear uh, remarkably little about any uh, uh, military action in these years. But he was definitely studying war manuals. Uh, I remember reading uh, 300 years of war manuals and strategy in order to get a better understanding of how to uh, pursue the, the Persians. And we're only told about that in the uh, 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 as, as a preamble to the beginning of his counterattack. But I'm sure you're right that uh, the uh, the thinking uh, with the little general staff and planning and uh, trying to get ideas from past from past experience and from all the uh, the military handbooks that that was probably going on in this time. Um, uh, but in this time, uh, Persians are still attacking Asia Minor, which they did in uh, uh, six seventeen. Then after a pause, they invade Egypt in 619. And probably by the end of 621, they're in firm control of the whole of Egypt and preparing to attack Asia Minor, the last Roman territory. And on the loss of Egypt, the loss of Egypt had a neutral effect on the Romans. Uh, am, I, am I correct? Um, being that uh, Egypt is, has been the breadbasket of uh, many empires, uh, when the Romans lost uh, Egypt, they still had a breadbasket to turn to. Which was North Africa, which was North, which was North Africa, and I was North actually, Africa. and I suppose that we don't hear about it. Uh, Sicily had been uh, uh, had been a sort of mini uh, breadbasket in the past, so maybe Sicily as well. Sicily is still in their hands, uh, but of course, uh, the distances are longer, and uh, the amounts are smaller. Okay. And another thing that I noticed that was uh, initiated into this war was um, religious ideology. Um, how do you, how did that shape the direction in which the war effort went? Because um, I really feel like that gave the Romans a bit of oomph that the yeah. Persians weren't able to have because they were trying to uh, be more ecumenical when it came to the religious differences. You're, you're absolutely right. Uh, the Persians simply couldn't respond. And it looks as if this was the chief Roman reaction to the loss of Jerusalem and then to the uh, rejection of uh, the humiliating terms that they'd offered. Their chief response was to go over to uh, you uh, you know propaganda religious propaganda of uh, you know the, uh, as powerful as they as they could make it, and then later uh, when we come into the era of the fight back was to go uh, was to um, uh, yeah, start um, uh, pouring uh, such propaganda out onto the troops to give them the sense that they were going to fight a holy war against an evil empire. And this is where you see martyrdom introduced into uh, theological, uh, in, into the thinking of the Romans. Was martyrdom, did martyrdom exist in, or did this concept of martyrdom on the battlefield exist in Christianity before 
this event? Or did Heraclius introduce a new concept with martyrdom on the battlefield? It was a new concept for Romans introduced by Heraclius, but it had existed before in Armenia at the time of the the two fifth century Armenian rebellions, the, 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 the rebellions of the Armenians in the Persian sector of Armenia against the Sasanian authorities. And then they are, it, and it's basically articulated by the Armenian clergy. And they see uh, the Armenian fighters and they're you know, enormously outnumbered uh, as they've got halos as they're, go, they're going into battle. So it was current. I mean, the notion uh, had uh, surfaced before. But, but it's very, very odd that in the very year that the prophet, uh, uh, after the Battle of Badr, uh, was in effect um, uh, um, uh, viewing those who died in a battle as martyrs, in that same year, Heraclius is announcing the same thing when he enters, he crosses into Persian territory. Yeah, I, I remember I heard you mention that before, and I found that to be a very interesting, like how, and, and, you know, that wouldn't have been the only thing that happened concurrently between uh, Heraclius and the Prophet Muhammad. But, you know, I, I, was that just happenstance? Was it a coincidence? Or were, as you mentioned, um, in Armenia, this concept had been brewing. Was there some type of connection to where in the Arabian Peninsula via its Christian population uh, that this concept that Muhammad was able to uh, grab hold of this concept or, or understand this concept and utilize it uh, towards his own um, troops because you know this this is kind of a hard thing to um, to kind of make sense of unless you know of course our sources are silent about a lot of things concerning Muhammad could have had more information available to him than what has been recorded but uh, I just find what you mentioned to be very interesting and I try to reconcile I was trying to reconcile it the first time I heard it myself. Well, I would, well, I mean, the, there were large Christian communities in Arabia, uh, particularly at Naj in Najran, uh, way, way to the south. Uh, there were some Christians in Mecca, and of course there were ramified trade connections with the north. So it, it's not impossible that it came down. But then, uh, you, you know, the prophet is so extraordinary that um, I, I wouldn't rule anything out. So uh, I, 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 I remain um, neutral on this uh, happenstance or connection. Uh, but basically, you've got a monotheist religion in the north and in, you know, in terrible trouble uh, coming up with the idea. And we've got uh, Muhammad uh, in Medina, but as you know, a small minority of the Quraysh are the, the true believers and who've uh, uh, emigrated uh, to Medina. So they are in a comparatively weak position. So it's, um, I mean, I think it's, so, you know, the, uh, the, the situations were comparable. Yeah, you see similarities between the two situations. So I, I, don't see it as impossible that both uh, that Heraclius, well, admittedly Heraclius was crossing the boundary from uh, Roman Armenian territory to Persian Armenian territory when he comes up with it. So that there's obviously a more direct possible connection. But whether the emperor really would have been aware of what Armenian clergy had said, you know, 150, 200 years earlier, I don't know. I suspect similar situations. Uh, uh, belief systems which are not that uh, dissimilar and are thoroughly monotheist, um, I think it could have happened, or it's divine design. <laughs> or as you mentioned in another podcast, uh, dust in the sunlight that people were able to just grab hold of and, and make it their own. Uh, you know, I actually have a lot more to say about that. There's another theory, I think it's called like the hundred monkey theory, where they did a test with monkeys and the monkey started doing something in one geographic, re uh, one region of the earth. And then all of a sudden monkeys in a totally different region were doing the same thing. So I, I, I don't think we should compare Heraclius and Prophet. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, you're going to get me in trouble. Uh, so, so we, 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 um, 
and uh, you know, I, you answered my my next question, which was, uh, what impact did Heraclius' view on martyrdom have on the formation of uh, Islamic identity? I think we're probably just going to have to put that one on the shelf for a bit until more information uh, is discovered. I can tell you that the late uh, Patricia Croner, who was the most extreme of all uh, ext uh, skeptics about Islamic origins, she was absolutely riveted when I, I came up with it, um, I suppose about 15 years ago at, at a seminar. And she then promptly went off to look through the Quran to see uh, what, uh, what evidence there is in the Quran for uh, uh, jihad, uh, uh, a jihad leading to uh, the rewards of paradise for those who died in battle. And so she came back with a great list for me. Um, <laughs> so there's absolutely, you know, it's not something that the Sira, that the biography of the prophet invented. It's something for which you've got plenty of justification in the holy book itself. Definitely, definitely. Um, and okay, so Kusra, moving on to Kusro's downfall. Because uh, he he had a long he had a long reign and he had many successive battles. Uh, I would have thought if I was witnessing it uh, as I was there, I would have thought he would have definitely taken the whole thing. But eventually, he meets his own downfall, and it's not really because of the Roman Empire, but because of his own actions or inactions. Uh, do you mind describing what led to the downfall of Kosovo II? Uh, now the the um, the picture presented uh, in I Iranian sources, as they were picked up in later Muslim sources, is that of Khosrow, an unjust ruler, a uh, an oppressor, uh, a a, uh, um, a harsh taxer of his people. Uh, expecting too much of his soldiers, endless campaigns, etc. So it's very much an internal view. And um, once he's overthrown, basically a charge seat is drawn up, uh, is presented uh, against him. Um, that's the internal view. The external view, which we get from looking at the Roman and Armenian and Syrian sources, uh, is that uh, Heraclius, Heraclius had a small expeditionary force, highly trained, mm. which managed by um, swift maneuvers to uh, escape being trapped by several of the Persian armies uh, and managed to defeat them one by one. So uh, basically, it, it was more than pinpricks. It mm. was uh, uh, serious defeats. Uh, but but nothing like the destru destruction of Persian of Persian armed forces. Basically, it was the Emperor Heraclius is managing to keep his army together, keep it safe, and to cause damage. And all of that, of course, would be greatly reducing the prestige of uh, Khosrow. But the crucial thing that Heraclius did when he invaded Persian territory in the first winter, which he spent in Azerbaijan, so what is now ex-Soviet Azerbaijan, uh, was to uh, send envoys to the Turkish Kagan and to uh, plead for Turkish intervention. And that occurred in some force in 626 and in greater force in 627. Uh, and, uh, and I think it was the, the combination of Roman victories Persian intervention in a force, bringing, up the, uh, bringing with it the prospect of a long, difficult, uh, possibly losing war that mm -hmm. led to uh, uh, opposition developing, both in the army high command and in the civil bureaucracy and in the court against Khosrow, so that a bloodless, a virtually bloodless coup took place on uh, the night of uh, 23rd, uh, 24th uh, February 628. 
And it's, it's the same situation uh, as when he rejected the concessions from the Romans, is that he kind of went against the old wor world order of things. Um, the, the aristocracy or the elites in the Persian Empire were dissatisfied with a lot of what Khosrow II was doing. And it destroyed the relation and he destroyed the relationship that they had between each other. Uh, which led to their um, so 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 it seems like the the Persians had somewhat of a senate like the Romans. Um, maybe it didn't function in the same way. But they basically have, have, they, yes, they, they, I mean, basic yes. Uh, I mean, it's not the same, but basically they have court assemblies and debates in court. So who is entitled to go to it and so on? We, we've no idea. But we hear of this in the uh, fifth century when they're debating what to do about the Armenians. And we, so there are occasional references to it. Uh, so, but in this case, it wasn't a court assembly that deposed him. It was a putsch organized one night, uh, both by leading courtiers uh, or lead, leading civil bureaucrats and the army high command. So basically the army organizes it. It's a, a put. And uh, then uh, he is replaced by uh, his son, uh, Ardashir. And then Ardashir, unfortunately, dies. Uh, 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 sorry, uh, not, not, not Ardashir. He's replaced by his son, uh, Carvard. Uh, 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 and Carvard dies, unfortunately, within a year. And then his young son, uh, 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 Carvard's young son, is on, is on the throne. And then he is uh, deposed when one of the great generals seizes power, Shah Baraz, in 630. Um, so there's basically instability at the top of the Sasanian Empire after the deposition of, of Khosrow. And that helps the Romans in their negotiations. Uh, definitely, because it seems like the powers that came in after Khosrow II were more inclined to make peace with uh, with uh, the, with Rome, with the Romans, and were willing to make way more uh, a, a considerable amount of concessions in order to uh, appease them. Yes, um, so, moving on to. Arabs, the Arabs, Muhammad, and the rise of Islam. Uh, what I'm definitely interested in is the impact that the Romano-Persian War had on the Quranic world, because it does give uh, glimpses from uh, that scene. So from your reading of uh, early Islamic history, uh, its source, its uh, primary sources, as well as having um, expertise in uh, Rome, uh, Byzantine history and Persian history, uh, what impact did the Romano-Persian war, war have on the Quranic world? Well, I think uh, um, the principal impact is in, uh, you know, this was a great war. It had lasted longer, it was more intense than any of the previous wars between the, the great powers. And so I think it, um, uh, it, uh, it lies behind uh, the apocalyptic apprehension that you see uh, dominant in the earlier surahs of, of the Quran, that, um, you know, the whole physical world, humanity, uh, the material world uh, that was nearing its end and uh, the day was approaching. Now that, and that, that given that I think, think of that was one of the most, uh, you know, daunting, um, powerful messages in the, the prophet's core message. There, I think we can see a clear, uh, we can see a clear connection. I mean, there were similar similar apprehensions were being voiced in different parts of the uh, the Roman Byz Byzantine world at the same at the same time. Um, so uh, uh, so th that I think is the uh, the, the principal uh, 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 effect. Uh, secondly, clearly the um, the client system, which was established by the uh, Sasanians to manage the northern desert. They had to extend it, you see, uh, not, not just for the desert frontage of uh, Mesopotamia, modern Iraq, but all around the north and way down uh, uh, Syria, Palestine, 
uh, basically, you know, to uh, the, the Sinai Desert. Now, uh, I think we've got very little evidence about this. That the that the that the Sasanians changed their um, system from relying on one principal client, the Lakma uh, of Hira, uh, to relying on a series of clients with their own sectors of the desert, mm. uh, and the Lakma repla were replaced uh, by uh, 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 another is uh, Sasanian. Uh, constructed uh, sort of coalition of uh, Bedouin tribes. Uh, and what happened in the middle sector, I don't know, but on, in the Palestinian sector, it looks as if, as if they recreated, uh, revived the Ghassan uh, tribal uh, nexus and gave the Ghassan sort of hegemony over the approaching tribes. Now, um, one, that the, the this reorganization weakened the traditional Bedouin shields of the of the settled lands beyond. And two, it was itself weakened as the war went wrong for uh, the Persians. Um, thirdly, obviously, both sides uh, uh, must have been suffering from some from war weariness. Uh, this is what most historians see as the absolute crucial thing. I don't, because war weariness in the case of the Romans was countered by victory, an yes. extraordinary victory, one against all the odds. So there should have been, uh, they should have been, you know, as as the, uh, the you know, the um, governing authorities and troops returned to Syria, and Italy, they should have been full of elation. Mm. As regards the uh, the Sasanians, the Sasanian army, the Persian army. Uh, 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 yes, yes, uh, the ruling classes must have, uh, have suffered a terrible shock because mm -hmm. of the defeat. But the main, uh, the main body of the armed forces was entirely undefeated, and it had gone from victory to victory to victory in conquering the Roman world. This was the army occupying Syria, well, northern Mesopotamia, Syria, Palestine, Egypt under the command of Sharabaraz. You know, uh, so that, uh, and uh, and indeed, when it came to battles against the new forces of Islam, uh, the Sasanian army put up a much better fight than did the Roman. Really? I find that to be extremely shocking being that, you know, how fast the, the, uh, the Arab armies were able to uh, go through Persia, but you're saying that they, but the Persian, uh, it, well, both Romans and Persians uh, counterattacked after the initial Arab successes, and the uh, the um, uh, but in, in the Roman case, uh, basically Syria and Palestine were conquered in less than two years. Okay. Uh, in the Persian case uh, for Mesopotamia, including what's now Khuzestan uh, next door, that is the Lowlands. Of Mesopotamia, mm -hmm. it took a good four years from uh, 636 through to late 640. Mm. Okay, so the Persian counterattack coming down from the north drove uh, the Arabs out of Mesopotamia, out into the desert. Mm. And there it was only, I think, through desperate measures of gathering all troops together that the an Arab, Arab forces could be assembled to face the Persians at Cadicia, which, of course, I can date Cadicia, 6th of January, 638. Yeah, yeah I was about to say it, it was uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, it was last yeah, week, yeah, yeah. Uh, hundreds and hundreds, over a thousand years ago. Uh, uh, and but then after Cadicia, it, you know, it took another another two years to uh, conquer uh, Mesopotamia, mm. and then another year to conquer Khuzestan. Okay, so looking at it that way, I can definitely see why the Persians put up a, a, a bigger fight, a better fight. Um, I guess I'm looking at how fast the whole of the Persian Empire was destroyed compared to the Romans. As you mentioned in your book, 
um, the Romans didn't see the Arabs as a, a superpower or a rival power until 300 years after uh, the, the rise of Islam. So I was under the assumption that the what the Arabs were doing to the Romans wasn't as drastic as what was happening to the Persians. But it looks like the argument you're making is that when you look at when you take it region by region, a certain region from the per, from the Roman Empire, a certain region from the Persian Empire, and you compare them, you see that um, the Roman uh, the regions that the Romans had under control in the Middle East fell faster than what the Persians had in the Middle East, which I found to be very interesting. Can I just correct you on one point? I think that. The, the Romans, for uh, about a hundred years, of course, they couldn't accustom themselves to the notion of the Arabs as the great power of the Middle East. But I think by the 730s, they did. So mm. they didn't just acknowledge them as an equal. Uh, they realized that they were much weaker and they would ha there would be a grim battle for survival. So, mm. uh, as it were, political consciousness lagged behind uh, reality. Uh, but as regards the, the, the conquest, of course, after uh, 640, after 641, uh, the two empires have different fates because the Romans managed to hold their mountain frontier on the Taurus uh, and prevent the Arabs uh, getting inland. And the Persians didn't succeed in holding their mountain frontier, the Zagros, mm. uh, so that highland Iran proper uh, was conquered in what I see as two brilliant campaigns separated by about four years, uh, conquered uh, by 752 when the last Shah and Shah was uh, killed mm. while fleeing eastwards. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to hold up too much more of your time, but you touched yeah, on a point that is what quite, you've done quite well. You know, it's an hour and three quarters. <laughs> oh, is that right? OK, well, you know, I don't know how much I have uh, quite a bit of time, but I just don't know how much my guests, how much time my guests have. So I always try to keep it within a certain time limit for them. But you said something that just sparked so many more thought uh, and it reminded me of something that I would have forgot if you hadn't have said it was one of the reasons why I became interested in your book. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, Professor Joe Hayward, uh, he's also a um, scholar of war and strategy. He oh. had told me that you and him are two of the few people who believe that that the Romans and Persians weren't weak at the time of the Arab conquest. Uh huh. Right. Yes. Yes. No. No. So obviously, I put the explanation for what happened. I put it firmly within Arabia and within Islam. Hmm. And, and, and break that down for me. Ah. <laughs> um. I, uh, uh, well, what I see is, is two extraordinary things that happened in Arabia. One had happened about, you know, the 150 years, three, gen, three, four, five generations before the prophet was the development of, uh, of Mecca and other cities uh, into proper city states uh, because of the economic uh, commercial uh, developments of the six. And just one thing, uh, James, in the point that you're about to make is that variance with Patricia's Crohn's thesis on mech and trade. Oh yes, completely at variance. And 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 one of the reasons was which I would say is uh comes from I think he was a British scholar at work in Germany in the uh late 19th century, who analyzed uh the uh commercial terminology in the Quran. Mm. And it basically uh showed that there is that the terminology used about spiritual matters. Uh, basically, is is a sort of borrow of accounting, um, uh, you know, plus and minuses. A, a lot of terminology is the terminology of the counting house, mm. uh, and argued from that that uh, you know there is a, an advanced uh, uh, commercial economy at Mecca. But my, uh, the, I mean, the, I think the unassailable argument. Uh, is the growth of uh, towns, uh, small towns and large towns, along the whole edge of uh, uh, the desert, uh, the desert frontage of Palestine. Mm. Uh, their growth in the 6th century, which you know, it's firmly dated to the 6th century, that shows that there's, 
there's something commercial happening and it's at the junction between the desert and the zone. Uh, well, and of course the other evidence, the other two sources are what the Quran itself says about trade, mm -hmm. maritime trade as well as trade by land, and also what we get in the pre-Islamic poetry preserved in the Syria about trade. Mm -hmm. So it's been absolutely, absolutely uh, uh, no doubt about that. And then Patricia Croner, towards the end of her life, did start changing her tune, yeah. uh, talking about wool and leather goods. Yeah. Well, but she always maintained, you know, there are, there's no, there are no unguents and incense uh, stuffs going north. But of course there were, in huge quantities, both from within Arabia and from probably further afield. Yeah, because from what I understand of her argument is that uh, Mecca seemed to be off the main trade route, but that still doesn't that still wouldn't explain that still doesn't explain them not having uh, commerce or being a trading center. And if you've got a great city off a main a main uh, route, well, of course, Me Mecca's original importance is the shrine, hmm. uh, the polytheistic shrine the, of the Kaaba. And well, well, no, its original importance is the wells. Then the shrine, it becomes a great cult center and associated with the cult center, it becomes a commercial center and then a city grows up. And yes, it's off the main route, but it's the uh, uh, it's the, the most convenient uh, the place where you can live in, at that point. And as you mentioned before, why would the biographers or the early uh, Muslim historians lie about or make something up about that, you know? Mm -hmm. Indeed. Uh, these is not and it's not like they were well i guess I, i'm in line with peter webb by seeing uh the muslim sources even though they're after the uh life of the prophet dealing with the prophet i don't see them as outsider sources they might be a little bit detached uh time wise but um i do feel like these people have some kind of inside more inside knowledge than what we want to give them credit that by the way is a wonderful book the way that this sort of ideological frame changes as we go through time. Yeah. Um, uh, th so that, that, that I see as an absolute key. So we basically we've got a, a city and one should think in terms of a city state. And I say that deliberately. So then we start thinking in terms of Athens and Sparta and uh, other uh, political and in, in the case of Mecca, political, religious, commercial uh, entity, uh, which had uh, connections of all sorts, north, east, south. Uh, so politically, so statecraft, it's got statecraft. So what you have that is that allied with the raw power of uh, a pure monotheist religion, which we know had an extraordinary effect, because it still has an extraordinary effect on the individual believer. And, and you also mentioned the Treaty of Hudaybiyah being another. Uh... That's, well, that's the key. Yes. Uh, well, that's that I see as the key uh, 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 event. Which reconciled the Quraysh. Uh, to the new religion uh, in that the new religion uh, 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 was ready to incorporate the Kaaba purified of all idol worship into it. So the Kaaba uh, pilgrimage, the Hajj, and everything to do with the Hajj, so that Mecca would have a central place within a new world, within a new world order. Uh, and, and But that, I think, was something which was um, I, I, I basically, and that is something which uh, 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 um, a uh, a decision which was made before Hudaybiyah because that was a concession made by the Muslims uh, which was uh, 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 which was required to get the concessions that the Quraysh offered at Hudaybiyah. As we have it, the account in the Sira it tells us that you know Muhammad wanted to go on the little pilgrimage but he was stopped at uh, stopped at the uh, 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 um, at the uh, uh, edge of the sac of the sacred area at, at Hudabia, and then talks take place. Well, it's that act which is a huge uh, concession, and then the Muslims their concessions are uh, basically to allow uh, proselytization to take place, 
from the Muslims in Medina throughout Arabia and to allow uh, Meccans who wish to come over uh, to Medina uh, to, to come. And then uh, basically within two years you have uh, the advance of Muhammad with large army escort and the formal submission of Mecca. But Hudaybiyah is crucial and Hudaybiyah only makes sense if that was the uh, concession offered. Uh, and we can say that the weaker party at Hudaybiyah was the Muslim side because when it came to the drawing up the treaty document about which the Syria is remarkably detailed, quite extraordinary. And it's, it's why I believe, it's one of the reasons for really believing the Syria has got, got an enormous amount of authentic information, material in it. I mean, we've also got the... Um, Hadith literature. What? Uh, were you going to say the Hadith you know, literature? I was going to say the, uh, the agreement, um, the agreement uh, between uh, the various parties uh, uh, after the arrival of the Muslims at Medina. Uh, the Constitution of Medina. Yes, uh, which, you know, the, even the greatest skeptics accept as an authentic document. Yeah, it's a document from its time, definitely. When you look at the, the, the language is archaic and it says some things about the Quraysh that um, if there was any tampering after the life of the prophet, probably would have been taken out. Yes, indeed. Well, and in the, it's a story of Hudaybiyah as given by we, we don't get a whole we don't get the whole document, but we we are told that there was argument about um, the preamble to the document, where the prophet wanted to be referred to as uh, the apostle or messenger of Allah, and the Quraysh said no, we refer to you by your family. Yeah. And then uh, they wanted Allah to be referred to as, uh, you know, the all-powerful, merciful, compassionate. And the Quraysh said, no, we'll refer to Allah, you know, he's, he's a God among one of the other. Now that tells one, that absolutely tells one for certain uh, that uh, Mecca was in a much stronger position, negotiating position at the time. But within, ten, within two years, because of key elements in the uh the prophet's message which i think made it enormously uh, uh enticing to the inhabitants of arabia within two years with islam spreading rapidly throughout arabia the Quraysh submit mm. and you have mentioned in one of your lectures that if this treaty at hudaybiyah didn't ever happen islam probably would have never spread out of the hijaz well, because the Meccans had the uh, uh, had the milit militarily had the upper hand, and the Muslims were were blockaded within uh, Medina, and uh, and then the Prophet, you know, would have would have would have died um, four years later, yeah. and then you would have had yes, and you know, a new sect, important. Uh, but without its its charismatic leader, so I don't know. I mean, that may be a foolish uh, 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 prognostication of mine, but it would have been taken a very, very, very different course. Would have moved very, very much slower. No, I I, I agree with you. Um, you know, maybe uh, it not spreading out of the Hejaz is a is is a bit is reaching a bit, but I definitely feel like the Treaty of Hudaybiyah was a game changer for uh, for the faith. And being that um, Mecca was a, uh, a a religious center as well as a center of commerce, um, it attracted a lot of people with its different fairs. Uh, Islam having a presence there definitely would have been good PR for uh, for the faith. So um, I would like to, uh, is, is there, I mean, cause I don't, I really don't want to get into the secret that you were, that you were uh, talking about concerning the Quran. Uh, you do have a really good interview on Myth Vision podcast concerning the secret of the, uh, con the secret of the Quran. And you also have a really good lecture on the, uh, the Quran as a historical source that I believe people should uh, go and check out as well, because you go a lot of what we just talked about in the last 15 minutes, you go over in detail. Um, so, uh, you know, is there anything 
that actually, you know, I do have one question for you. And uh, it's a new one that I would like to introduce because uh, a lot of time when it comes to uh, historical knowledge, a lot of people who aren't so much in the history always ask, well, what's the point? This stuff happened a thousand years ago. What type of relevance does it, what kind of, what, what relevance does it have today? And so I would just like to get your thoughts on this final question. What lessons can be drawn from the events of the last great war of antiquity that can be applied to larger conflicts in our modern world? Yes. Uh, well, I, I, I reply first by saying the, uh, I mean, the reasons for looking at the past uh, and all sorts of different parts of the past is basically to get a perspective on, on the present and to improve our understanding of uh, the variety of uh, human societies that there have been in the past and the interplay between faith and uh, commerce and politics and the, 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 the social order. Um, and I think that the, it, 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 that's the venture that historians are engaged in, basically to understand ourselves better and our neighbors better mm -hmm. by having a better understanding, but by gaining improved, under, uh, uh, by gaining knowledge of, of, of the past. So that would apply uh, to the last great war as a war. For, um, Direct, uh, direct. Uh, well, obviously, there's a lesson which is when you're doing well, don't, don't, uh, don't go too far. Mm -hmm. uh, the cautionary tale of of Kuzro. Uh, obviously, it's of relevance to Middle Eastern history, but where you see, you know, different political religious systems, different political boundaries, uh, but you see the ways in which a physical geography has an impact uh, on events. Uh, uh, what, what they say, geography is the mother of history? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and really no historian should, should be right about it. If they think of what, what they're writing about is just a sort of flat map, uh, they, they um, but unless they're writing about Florida. <laughs> uh, the, um, but then, but then I think uh, it's it's really it's on superpower relations. That's where you once got a, a, a tale of how they were managed in the past. Uh, um, and it basically how a period of coexistence lasting for 120 years was then destabilized. Restabilized a bit, destabilized. Um, but uh, again and again through allowing, you know, cause the causal chain, uh, sort of uh, action and reaction to get on, uh, it eventually destabilized uh, the whole the whole thing. Um, and otherwise, um, it indicates yes the importance of immaterials, of ideology, uh, prestige. Um, and deception. <laughs> no. War is deception. All right. Well, thank you for those. Uh, thank you for those thought provoking final words. And I really hope that people take them in and apply them to their own life. Uh, and I would like to see more people involved in the study of history, because for myself, as you just said, uh, the study of history is for the person who is studying it. And since I've been very much uh, intertwined with the study of history, looking at different people and regions, I feel like it's definitely given me something that some a, a bit of enlightenment and made me a better person by broadening my outlook, uh, where I probably would have had a more narrow uh, understanding if I didn't. So James, Dr. James, Howard Johnston, Mr. James Howard Johnston, thank you for joining me on my platform for what I believe was a very interesting and thought provoking discussion. I hope people go out and buy your uh, latest book, <laughs> the Last Great War of Antiquity. Uh, you do have another one, um, The uh, uh, Witness to a, a World Crisis. Hopefully, I didn't say the title incorrect. Um, that's one that I'm going to go and uh, purchase uh, soon and read for myself. Well, uh, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I mean, you've given me a pretty thorough uh, going over. 
but uh, it was fun and your, the questions were good. And I hope the answers, well, some of them have been illuminating. Anyway, thank, thank you so much. Thank you.